I think the historians will probably talk about some of the legitimate demands that the residents are calling upon the broader world community to support. They've made the single largest concession possible in order to avoid another massacre. They've agreed to be relocated to Camp Liberty. At one time they thought it was a military camp. They thought it was of massive size and all of a sudden it has been compressed to a small area around which they are building walls which doesn't sound like a resettlement camp, it sounds more like a prison. And we must demand that the U.S. and the U.N. live up to those promises made early on in the discussions about humane conditions at Camp Liberty, the preservation and protection of privacy. We do have a thousand women We've been told that there will be a robust U.S. presence there to observe, which we think is very important. But we're still unsure what that means. We're told that there will be U.N. observers there, but we don't know whether they're going to be intermingled with the residents or whether or not they're going to be outside the prison walls or gates and only allowed access when the Iraqi government chooses to allow them access. We see no reason whatsoever, it's not an unreasonable demand to keep the Iraqi police and the Iraqi army outside of Camp Liberty. It's a matter of sovereignty. It's on Iraqi soil. We appreciate that. There is no reason for them to be involved and have personnel inside Camp Liberty. None whatsoever. And you know why we're concerned about that? Let history not record that this panel said publicly that there was an incident or two inside the camp precipitated by either the police or by the Iraqi army and used as an excuse for the humanitarian massacre and onslaught that all of us are working so hard to resist. The demands are reasonable. And I say to the UN Special Envoy, to our Special Envoy, you must use every influence you possibly can. And for those who say we have no, we are not part of this anymore, I remind my friends in the United States 4,400 gold star mothers in America whose sons and daughters have been killed to bring self-government and democracy to Iraq. And I would dare say I would not want to be speaking for them the pain, the sorrow, the anguish to have lost someone in Iraq. But I can't believe that a single American parent who lost a son or daughter on the field of battle in Iraq would tolerate a United States government sitting idly by while the government that their sons and daughters lost their life in fighting to preserve and protect went in and massacred innocent, defenseless citizens of another country. It is un-American. American, unworthy of America. I like to tell people from time to time, America, if it were a product, what we try to sell is a brand. You know, every product that you like, there's a brand associated with it and you're attracted to it. Well, sometimes I think America gets a little preachy around the world about our brand. There are certain characteristics of, the, of our country of which I'm particularly proud, and it is the freedom and the tolerance and the diversity. It's also the rule of law, the Constitution of the United States, our credibility. So the fourth theme that I think we need to, hopefully the historians will record, is that our persistent cry to delist, delist, delist was finally heard by the United States government. The EU, the UK, even the courts in the United States have said there is no reason, there's no legal justification 
My colleagues here have heard it, and perhaps you've heard me mention this before, ladies and gentlemen, but every day while I was privileged to serve my government, both in the White House and as Secretary of Homeland Security, just about every day for almost four years, I got a list of terrorist threats against the United States. And I must tell you, not on one occasion. In those four years getting those lists, sometimes it was a couple pages, sometimes it was a couple dozen pages, but at no time did I see a reference to the MEK. Never. And what an irony, what an absolute irony it is for the greatest terrorist state in the world, the most significant terrorist state in the world, the exporter of terrorism around the world, that's got surrogates, Hamas, Hezbollah, the Islamic Jihad, we all know what it is, for them to be having so much influence in Baghdad after we've sacrificed blood and treasure to give this regime an opportunity to create a freedom-loving society. Delist, delist, delist. Do it now. And this is Roger V. again. It is a high honor for me to be associated with you, but also with the distinguished international presence here on the panel, and I pledge to you, I dare say I'm not going to speak, I rarely speak for a crowd other than myself or an individual other than myself, but I think I'm in pretty safe territory if I say that all of us are with you side by side as long as it takes. Thank you. Thank you, Governor Rich. Our next speaker is also a former governor from the great state of Pennsylvania. Please welcome Governor Ed Rendell.